Let's uh, introduce our guest returning to the show for the fourth time. Yes, fourth time. Welcome back to the show, Mr. Stephen Stanton. Morning, this is Sean Connery talking for Stephen Stanton in Los Angeles. <laughs> Excellent. Hi, Sean Connery. Oh, hello. <laughs> How's it going? Say sock. What's that? Did say sock. Socks. <laughs> Red socks. Why so? <laughs> How's that? Is that Stephanie talking? Yeah, yeah that's, that's my wife. I wanted to hear Sean Connery say the word socks. Yeah, it's, me and my roommates last year realized how Sean Connery would say socks, and we thought it was hilarious. So <laughs> that's how we said socks for months. Okay. Well, that's that's a thing to do, I think. That should be like a meme on the Internet or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it's crazy. Wait, Chris Walken. Wait, Sean Connery says socks. It's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can get uh, is it Daryl Hannah who does his double on uh, Saturday Night Live for Celebrity um, Jeopardy. Well, I don't do Daryl Hannah, so I don't do a Daryl Hannah impression. I, I was just wondering. I, I think that's the one who, who's a cast member on SNL who always did his uh, Celebrity Jeopardy and. Oh you know, yes, yeah, right. Yes, exactly. I'll take the rapist for four hundred. Yes, Daryl Hammond. Uh, I think it's. it's a, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so uh, yeah, my wife is here. This is the first time she's ever spoken to a voice actor ever. So. Wow. So this is. Uh, I hope it's not a disappointment. <laughs> 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 Only you know spoken for like you know a minute and a half here, but uh, I hope it's. I hope it's all you expected it to be. She, she was trying to look up some of, some of your voices. I'm like, you know, he does a lot of voices. You probably won't be able to find a definitive list of all of them. And she found a list. Well, there's some. I'm just on IMDb. Oh yeah, yeah. Now you didn't meet any voice actors when you went to Salt Lake Comic Con. She didn't go with me. She had to work. And uh, when we actually, when I went to Salt Lake Comic Con, uh, I was supposed to work, but they canceled work every single day. So I was like, well, I'm going to stay here. And let's well, walk yeah. around. Naturally, of course. <laughs> Take advantage. Yeah. So how did you? Enjoy, how uh, how was our nice balmy weather here in Utah? Oh, uh, it was great actually because you know it had snowed a few days before we all arrived, so that was already you know the streets were clean and there wasn't anything coming down, there wasn't any sleet or anything like that, so it was just kind of you know cold and dry. But um, you know it was it was great for walking around and seeing the sights and uh, you know just being out outside in general. You know we were all coming from 80 plus degree weather in Los Angeles. Um, of course, Jimmy Mack and his wife, Wendy, they were coming from sub-zero temperatures in Chicago, so it was like a tropical vacation for them. <laughs> yeah, uh, Steph's from Wisconsin, and I'm from Alaska, so Utah's not cold. <laughs> yeah, I actually bought a jacket while I was out there because I didn't come equipped as, uh, with something heavy enough because I just don't have anything like that anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I remember every time I go to L.A. in the winter, I'm wearing shorts at like 40, and everyone else is wearing their coats and weird layered stuff. <laughs> right. Well, we're all acclimated. Plus, it's the only time of the year we get to wear cool-looking stuff with long sleeves. And, you know, it's like the only time that stuff gets broken out of the closet. So even if it's, you know, 72 degrees, people will still be walking around with fashionable jackets and things like that on because otherwise you just can't wear them. <laughs> so is this your first time coming to Sundance? It is. Um, for me personally, uh, some of the people in my crew were not the first time, but uh, we had a, a pretty big group there. It was myself, uh, my managers, Dutch and Kathy. Uh, my good friend Rick Fitz was along with us. He, I think he'd been to Sundance before. Um, and then uh, Jimmy Mack, of course, uh, that many of you uh, will know from Rebel Force Radio and also uh, The River in Chicago. And then his wife, uh, Wendy Snyder, who has the morning show on WGN, the Bill and Wendy show in Chicago. And then our two media photography people, Mark Edwards and Scott Allen, who are both members of the 501st in Southern California. And then... Um, uh, let's see who else was with us. Uh, Leanna Vamp and her uh, uh, her partner Carmen, uh, Cameron, excuse me, I'm saying his name wrong. 
um, they joined us uh, at Sundance as well. So yeah, we had a pretty pretty big group. So uh, I guess the, the the burning question at people who don't follow you on Facebook religiously um, would, would like to know is why were you at Sundance? I was at Sundance for the world premiere of a, a documentary film that I had the pleasure to work on called Life Itself. And uh, it's a, a documentary about the life of Roger Ebert, the film critic, uh, based on the book, his memoir of the same name. And it was directed by Steve James, who some of you might know as the director of the very uh, well-known documentary Hoop Dreams, which uh, Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel were very much champions of. Uh, back when that came out in the uh, the early 90s. So I had, uh, Steve James had asked me to narrate uh, the film, the portions of the film that uh, have Roger's mem portions of his memoir narrated in Roger's voice because no one has heard Roger speak for the last, you know, since about 2006 or so, I believe it was, because of his... Uh, you know, the operations that he had that had to remove all the portions of his jaw and everything like that. So these are words that uh, people have seen in print but have never heard Roger say. So that was kind of my job, to dial in his voice as best as possible and uh, narrate those portions of the film, which people seem to love. Uh, the film got a very good response. That's great. And is that what brought um, Jimmy down as well? Or is he just coming down to hang with you? Well, Jimmy always likes to hang, but uh, both Jimmy and his wife, Wendy, are Chicago natives. Uh, both of them knew Roger. R Jimmy actually has some very good Roger Ebert stories <laughs> that he can tell you, or I think some of them will be in a video interview that he did with me uh, while we were at Sundance, uh, because he actually sat next to Roger during uh, the screening, uh, one of the screenings of um, the special edition of The Empire Strikes Back. And uh, Jimmy said that he walked away from that film with a completely different uh, uh, opinion and image of Roger Ebert than he had before. He really got to see a different side of him that he just wasn't aware of. I think if I recall Jimmy talking about that story, wasn't that the one where it, I want to say either Roger Ebert or one of the the critics fell asleep and then wrote a review about it after he woke up? That's part of that story. And like I said, that's, that's Jimmy's story, so I don't want to tell it for him. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a it's a great story, and uh, you know Jimmy has definitely he and Roger have had different opinions about Star Wars in general, and and, and at one point Roger uh, printed one, Jimmy's response or letter to him, you know, uh, as part of one of his uh, one of his reviews or blog entries. So he was very much about you know uh, talking about films, or he wasn't he wasn't afraid of debating films with fans. So um, yeah, it was it was. You know, every it was really interesting at that screening because it was the first time it was being shown in public, and that film was so riveting at times. I mean, literally, you couldn't hear, you could, to, to use a cliche, you could hear a pin drop in that audience of 550, I think it was. I mean, it was so silent where people were just laser focused on what was happening or being said on the screen. It was it was amazing, and it was very emotional too. There was a lot of Kleenex being pulled out at the end of end of the film, myself included, and then uh, a lot of teary eyes, because it's, it's a very moving uh, film. Wow. That, I, I've heard actually good things about it coming out of um, out of Sundance, because I have lots of friends and you know, people I know that I go to Sundance every single year, but since I work at a hospital in the afternoon, evenings, it makes it so it's really hard to do any trips like that on my schedule. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, and one of the things that I noticed, that, yeah, there, there was a, you know, very loyal audience that was in there. I'm sure that most of them were either really, they were film people or people that really liked Roger or really wanted, or were fans of sneak previews. If you're a fan of sneak previews, this is a film you have to go see because the outtakes of uh, the filming of, of Gene and Roger behind the scenes where they're kind of bickering at one another. It's, it's, it's both hilarious and just, it's one of a kind stuff. You're never going to see it anywhere else. It's uh it's it's almost worth it for some, for some of that, you know. <laughs> and just on a, a, a side random note, it's it's probably also the first time you'll leave L.A. to go to you know the mountains, and you'll have worse air quality here than you did in L.A. Well, you know they they showed us that we that inversion layer is probably what you're talking about, right? Yeah, where they announced that Provo and this area has had the worst air in the nation, well, if not the world, for the past couple of days, and we're like, that's embarrassing. 
Well, you know, on some days it was better than others. I mean, I remember waking up, uh, I don't know if it was Saturday. I think I woke up in the morning, and it was crystal clear outside, and you could just see for miles and miles. And the mountain ranges are just, they're stunning. I mean, it was it was a beautiful, uh, it's beautiful, beautiful surroundings just in that area. Now, this is my first time being uh, to Sundance, but also my first time to Salt Lake. Uh, my friend Rick Fitz, he's been to Utah many, many times for uh uh, with his band and some other film projects that he's worked on, but this is the first time I'd uh, I'd ever been there, so it was uh, it was gorgeous to be able to just kind of explore the city a little bit and um, check out some of the great places to eat, and then of course go to the we were you know literally right around the corner from the uh, the Mormon Temple, and we got to see you know the I think it's the Tabernacle where that incredible organ was there with the those 11,000 something pipes in there that took 12 years to make. We got to sit in on one of the recitals of that. It was just amazing. Yeah, I, I, I love going there to see the sites. I still haven't gotten my co-host to want to come here, though. He keeps on claiming I'll brainwash him and he'll never be able to leave. And I was like, <laughs> come and see. It's not like I'm going to kidnap you. No, you know, everybody we met there on the grounds were the, uh, you know, were all the all those buildings where they were so sweet, so friendly, so accommodating. And I remember when we were sitting in there listening to the organ, uh, of course, you've got a bunch of Star Wars people in there, you know, Jimmy Mack, and everyone's wondering, hey, I wonder if, you know, if we tip him, he'll play a little John Williams Star Wars theme for us, because everyone was wondering how amazing that would sound. I said, he probably does that on his break when no one's around, you know, probably slips into a little Star Wars theme every now and again. I don't think I've ever heard them play Star Wars related stuff. I know I've heard them play some Lord of the Rings music in there, because they played um, in Dreams from Fellowship of the Ring. I, I've heard them play Broadway stuff in there, but I don't think I've ever heard John Williams. So I wouldn't actually. When John Williams has directed the the Tabernacle Choir before, so I, I make the difference. They have played John Williams stuff. <laughs> Plus, the Tabernacle Choir sang the Winter Olympics theme in 2002 when it was here when mm -hmm. John Williams directed. So. They do have John Williams stuff they've played there. It's just he's the one who's directed it usually when, he's, when, he's, when they've done it. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. The, the organ itself is one of those things that you look at and you can't even understand how a human being can learn to play that. Not only, you know, it's like the multiple levels of keyboards plus all the foot pedals and all the side pulls and plungers and stuff. I mean, it makes something, you know, it makes the Phantom of the Opera or Captain Nemo that look like pikers with their organs, you know. Yeah, yeah, it, it's. I'm, I'm glad you got to see some, one of the recitals, cause, uh, or yeah, the recitals, because those are very impressive, and uh, it, it's 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 hard to believe it until you actually see it. No, and it, you really feel it. I mean, it reverb the acoustics of that building is is incredible because you feel it all through your rib cage and everything like that. When the uh, when the organist was finished, the audience gave him a huge round of applause when he was done, and he took his bows and everything. I mean. Uh, well worth to to go see and hear if you're ever in that area. But, you know, and there's just you know the architecture of the of the temple itself is amazing. I mean, it's it's so striking. We got some great pictures there with all of us posed in front of it. You know, it's just uh, it's just a beautiful beautiful structure. I do agree. So, um, since this is my wife's time first meeting a voice actor, we're gonna let her ask a few questions. So I guess I'm gonna break the ice a, a, a little bit. Um, since I've always had this question. Voice actors, every single time they've ever been on the show, always talk about how they, you know, they're always auditioning for things. They're always, you know, sending us stuff. What does a voice acting audition usually entail? Like, are you, do they say give you a part and some lines and you give them a voice that you think would fit that? Or do they say give us, you know, this type of voice? Or like, how, how does an audition for, for voice acting work since you guys do it all the time? Well, it, it depends on the project. but And here's where I want to say, you know, voice acting and is is a, is a lot more than just doing character voices for animation. A lot of voiceover acting auditions are for uh, television and radio commercials, which is there's a, there's more of that being done in voiceover than there is animation. The people that work in animation is a much smaller group than the people that work in commercials. Uh, the people that audition for TV promos, you know, tonight on, you know, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., a brand new episode, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, you've got movie trailers, and uh, you have things like narration and audio books. You have industrials for in-house use at ad agencies and corporations. I mean, there's just a multitude of the kinds of projects apart from animation that voiceover actors audition for. Now, having said that, the 
generally an audition consists of a piece of paper with a sample of the dialogue that you're going to do and some sort of outline of uh, what we call specs. It's like, what is the age, general age of the character? Is it male? Is it female? Does it matter? Uh, you know, or are they looking for like a gruff sort of manly voice? Or are they looking for something that's friendly and, you know, uh, comfortable and conversational? And conversational comes up a lot in uh, voiceover specs. The last thing that they want you to do, especially for television commercials and things like that, is to put on a voice or sound like a character. Ordinarily, what they want is somebody that sounds like a peer, you know, you know, so that you're going to go out and buy that, you know, box of Carnation instant breakfast drink, not because somebody says you should buy this now, but it's somebody saying, you know, you should go buy this. I liked it, so if I liked it, you'll like it. Have so you ever had an audition where they just requested something extremely bizarre of you, like I don't know, a, a very, very strange voice, or the instructions were just something that? are so abnormal that it, it, it's, I don't know, have you ever had a really bizarre audition that you don't know why they're asking it, but uh, it's just, it just was something very different? Well, I mean, they'll do things like, uh, you know, they'll ask you to, sometimes they'll give you a character, you know, other celebrities that they say, like, we're looking for something in the vein of Morgan Freeman or Sam Elliott, or I, I got an audition once for an animated thing where they said, we're looking for something in the range between Dean Martin and Snoop Dogg, uh, meaning cool, I guess, is what they were looking for, but they were looking at two opposite ends of cool or two different kinds of cool. Um, Bioshock, which, you know, when I got the audition for that, it did not say what it was for, that it was a game. It had nothing to say that this was for the Big Daddy character. It was just... We need sort of like strange creature sounds in these different emotive states. And they had a list of like a half a different emotions and they wanted weird creature sounds. And that was essentially it. So I laid down, you know, my best weird creature sounds and I ended up booking the job. <clears throat> and when I went to the job, I still didn't know what it was for. They just wanted more of the same. And it wasn't until over a year later when they wanted me to do additional dialogue that they said, okay, this is what it's for. This is your character and here's the animation for it. And I finally got to see it. And, uh, you know, that's one of the strange things that happens many times in voiceover is that you don't know what it is you're doing for. And it's only because what you did matched what they heard in their mind for whatever it is that they're doing that you got the job. I think it was Anna Graves who told us that, like, most voice actors have, like, a death reel where they just have to record their characters dying in many different ways, or they eventually have recorded themselves dying in so many ways that they just have a reel of, like, random death noises that they have. Have you ever had to do something like that where you just record yourself dying in tons and tons of ways because video games and TV shows like that? Well, that's, yeah, that's pretty much the, uh, that's primarily the realm of video games. And that, it stems from the fact that video games are, don't have a straight through storyline. They have multiple storylines based on the, the game player's choices. So, I mean, there's sometimes, I think it was like, you know, like Lord of the Rings or let's say Command and Conquer, I think it was. You had to do every kind of, uh, version of death that they had an animation for on the screen like you know you're getting blown up you're getting torn apart you're drowning you're set on fire you're thrown off a cliff you're being beheaded you're being run over by a pack of you know wild animals whatever it was and you've got to do this over and over and over again and it's i find it very stressful on the voice i tend to stay away from games anymore that uh, that require that just because it's um, it's not healthy, you know, it, it strains your vocal cords. You know, back in the days of old time radio, as they like to call it, they used to bring in specialists for doing things like screaming or baby crying and stuff like that. They never let the you know the main actor, the people whose voices were on on microphone every week, strain their voices by doing something like that. They got people in who could do it without straining their voices. It's something I wish. It's a practice I wish would come back getting stunt vocal performers in to do things. Because when you're screaming, you know, it's hard to tell who's doing it. And uh, I think it saves a lot of actors' voices. I know a lot of people who have injured their voice doing video games. It's, it's not a lot of fun. You always have to take time to recover. And during the recovery time, you, you miss work. <laughs> and then your agents get mad at you and everything. And so, yeah, it's... Um, it's a mixed bag. I don't have a death reel per se, just I haven't because most of that stuff was done on the job, not at my home studio, so I don't have copies of all that stuff. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so I guess 
one more question for me before I, I see if Steph has any questions. Um, so how do you like it that because of Clone Wars, now you've basically become known as the voice of Tarkin? And so like in projects from Phineas and Ferb to, I'm assuming Rebels, because it says so on IMDb, and other other projects, you've become this iconic Peter Cushing character. I think it's I think it's great. It's you know it's been lovely to step into Peter Cushing's slippers, so to speak, and help uh, bring that role uh, back to back to new audiences. You know, so that it doesn't just uh, end with the uh, with the you know Star Wars: A New Hope. Um, it's one of those characters that I thought was so interesting that you know it definitely begs to be explored in uh, in new stories. I think we did a you know a great starting point uh, in Clone Wars. With having meet, meeting the young Tarkin and having him get Anakin on his side and starting to see how that uh, relationship develop, and you know of all the uh, all the you know classic original trilogy characters to do, uh, I couldn't have picked a, a better one for myself just because I, I so love Peter Cushing and his work. It's such an honor to be able to like just take one of his characters and run with it and just you know. Uh, add more to the uh, add more to the story. It's been a lot of fun, and I hope to do a lot more with that. Awesome. Well, so Steph, do you have any do you have any questions or any requests or anything? I really wish you told me you were gonna do this before we started. <laughs> Ask you questions. <laughs> <clears throat> you probably stole all her good questions. Did you? <laughs> um. I guess one thing I always kind of wondered about voice actors is uh, the people that you, the other actors that you imitate or do voices of, like, do you ever meet them? Or, like, is there some type of relationship between normal actors and voice actors? Well, most of the time, um, part of the reason that I'm, imitating or doing impressions or voice matching an actor is usually because they're not in Los Angeles. They're someplace else. They're on another project on a set somewhere where they can't be reached and can't come into the studio. So more often than not, I don't meet them, but I do meet the director of the film. And that director and I work together in helping to bring about the performance that is missing from the film, you know, for the new lines of dialogue. And they try to get me into what the other character, what the other actor did. In some instances, in most instances, what they do is they give you samples of dialogue from the film. So you have a reference point. So you say, okay, this is what, you know, Liam Neeson or whomever did in this particular film. They're either speaking with an accent or without an accent. And sometimes they've actually sat me down and had me watch one or two reels of the film before we get started. So I get a real feel for the performance. And so that I'm not just kind of doing, you know, an impression or an imitation. They really want me to understand what that actor has done. So those are the ones where it's re it's really great to work on because the director and everybody are taking it very seriously and you know they're not just here to have you put a patch some on something or a band-aid. They really want you to become uh, as close as you can to the character that the other actor created. That answer your question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so no so yeah, so the simple <laughs> the simple answer is no, we usually don't meet. Uh, that's <laughs> that's the simple answer to that. Um, so one question I have is, you do all those shorts on, uh, on well, you, at least on your Facebook with your action figures, I'll just say. Um, is there, like, how did you start doing those? Was it, you know, a, a couple of my friends and I, we came up with some ideas, but they're probably all wrong. Like, one of them was that you, you're you basically continuing what you like to do when you were younger, and so now that you have more, I don't know, more expertise you can do them better but like is it do you do those sorts just for fun or did they start off as a job and you just continued them for fun or do you do them to like continue your visual effects skills or why, why, what's the story behind all those sorts that you do well first off Stephanie is he stealing another one of your questions again off your <laughs> no <laughs> okay <laughs> we'll just send him out of the room for a while and you you and I can talk um, but uh, as far as this you're talking about the Sarge and uh, Hamish and all the yes the, stop motion uh, action figures. Yeah, that really started out as uh, as something for fun for me uh, to do uh, just because I didn't have YouTube as a kid. And when I was a kid, I was uh, doing Super 8 stop motion films with all uh, the action figures that me and my brother had. And 
you know, they're very crude kind of things and they were silent. They never had any sound. And so I thought, well, here's a chance for me to kind of like come up with a concept that'll only take me a couple of hours to do when I do it. And, uh, you know, give me a chance to put some funny voices to all those action figures I had as a kid. So that's where it started. And that's why in the beginning, you know, the animation is very limited in those things because they were more kind of like animatics or slideshows because I was trying to make them as quickly as possible. But the thing, what happened was I started having more fun with them and the audiences started <laughs> to have more fun and, you know, asking for different things and they just became more complicated. So now, you know, you know, they take me a couple weeks to do <laughs> sometimes to shoot, but we're getting, um, you know, get a lot of positive response, especially from uh, a lot of people in the military, especially if they're deployed overseas, they watch them. We've seen pictures uh, of people showing us, uh, you know, uh, Marshall Teague, one of our friends has said that somebody <laughs> sent him a picture, uh, a few guys that are gathered around the hood of their Humvee with their iPad and they've got, you know, the Sergeant Hamish and they've got their 50 caliber pointed up in the sky. And it's, you know, it's great. It's, and we also found out that uh, a lot of guys who are in military hospitals and rehab are watching them and getting a lot of laughs out of them, which is really great to hear because that's the main reason I'm doing it is just to make people laugh. And if uh, we can help out in any way with people that have served the, our country in the military. Um, hey, I'm all, all the more, you know, happy to do it. Awesome. And then the the book club started with your interview that you did on the Force Cast, where they said how Morales should just be part of a book club or something, right? Yeah, that came out. We were doing a a, a, a podcast with Jimmy Mack and Jason, and. Just, you know, Sean, Sir Sean and Chris Walken and George W. Bush all started to show up and talking about reading, I think, Splinter in the Mind's Eye and Bridges of Madison County. And it just started turned into the Star Wars book club. And then, of course, uh, they kind of sort of merged with uh, Uncle Morallo's bedtime stories. And uh, what can I say? A classic was born. <laughs> and then the Daleks have invaded several times and. Well, yes, because I think uh, George W. thinks that his uh, the uh, the Dalek that support his TARDIS Winnebago is a is a droid. He's not aware that it's a Dalek actually, because it's the same color as R two D two, and it has a it has a craving for uh, circus peanuts for some reason. I don't know why that Dalek wants to be served circus peanuts. Well, Uncle Morallo is over there drinking hot uh, cinnamon uh, old spice, you know, as a Christmas uh, beverage. <laughs> and Christopher Walken just wants to get back to the story. Uh, you know, Chris Walken, he's got a lot of, he always seems to have just that close. He's always uh, not quite on the money. He doesn't seem to know what they're talking about. He's always talking about his Lando Calrissian costume. He thinks, you know, People mistake it for Zorro because he has the wrong mustache or something like that, you know. So he's he's always just not quite there, you know. And Sean Connery just wants to watch Zorro. Con Sean Connery wants to watch Zorro and just get on with the, you know, he's a, he's a big Star Wars fan, but he's got these two other guys that keep changing the subject and talking about hungry, hungry Jawas and, you know, building dioramas and going back in time to get Star Wars collectibles. So he's trying to rein in the other guys and just... And it doesn't help things that Morallo evolved as a fugitive uh, that, you know, is trying to engage them to help him, you know, escape the, the authority. So, yeah, he's got his hands full with that group. Okay. Um, so this next question, this actually comes from my nephew, because I realize you're one of the few people that can actually answer this who I've ever talked to. And so my nephew was watching the movie Cats and Dogs. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you might not have worked on this directly, but I know you worked on the movie, but... He he watches these animals talk, and he just wants and uh, to quote him directly, how they do that. Yeah. How, that. <laughs> how do they make animal like how do how do they get them to actually talk and look like it's their actual jaw and make it match and so on? And since he worked on cats and dogs, I guess. You could right. Add I did, uh, you had a little bit of work on that back in the day. The, the the experts at making animals talk in the industry was of course Rhythm and Hughes, who uh, a lot of people know uh, worked on the the feature film Life of Pi. They've been doing animals since day one. They kind of taught the rest of the industry how to do it. Essentially, and I'm not going to be, I'm no expert at this, so I'm just going to give you the rough sketch of how they do it. They film the animals, and then they, they overlay animation and can move the live-action mouth around and overlay animation on top of it. They're very good at making it appear as though that, you know, that's a fully 
live, you know, creature that's talking. But usually the mouth is uh, is a combination of the, the actual animal's mouth and some computer animation that's being manipulated to the uh, dialogue that's already been recorded in advance. You know, the actors record their dialogue and then they make the animal, they animate the mouth to match the dialogue. It's pretty straightforward in that regard. They actually have been doing stuff like that back in the old, you know, pre-digital days, you know, back in the 30s and 40s, they would just overlay a cartoon animation over the mouth of an animal. You know, they would draw it on animation cells and overlay it on the uh, on the film uh, using what they call like, you know, a, a down shooter animation camera or a bipack and uh, and shoot it that way. So it's it's a technology that's been around for a long time, but now they just got it down so that it's completely believable. So I know that's probably a little bit more technical than, than he, um, how old is your nephew? Six? Maybe. Six. Well, he's not old enough. When he gets older, there's a really good magazine that comes out that explains all this stuff called Cinefix Magazine. It's been around for a long time. The publisher is Don Shea, and he, a long time ago, managed to gain the trust of all the effects houses and convince them to tell them his secrets on how they do things. And he assured them that it wouldn't spoil things for the audience. And so Cinefix Magazine has been around for a long time. Back issues are full of all kinds of really cool information on some of your favorite films going all the way back to you know the original king kong he actually you know found people that worked on that ray harry house and all the old timers so if you like effects that's a good magazine to read okay and then um i guess last one about about special effects what exactly is the difference between a digital scanner operator and a digital scanner technician because you're, you're on there as both for when you work for tippet and i i have no idea what those actually mean you know, that was a during the early days of digital, which I was uh, very fortunate to be a part of. Uh, we were making these n names up as we go along. Nobody knew what to call them because there were no such things. Uh, um, when I worked with uh, the very first digital films that I worked on were with Jim Rigel, and if you're a fan of Lord of the Rings or the, you know, the upcoming Godzilla film, you'll know his name as the visual effects supervisor for those films. Jim and I worked together at Boss Film when it was just him, myself, and uh, an intern from a college working there for free. And so there were no, these were just, you know, we didn't know what to call these things. Digital camera operator is, I think, the very first credit I have. Uh, digital scanner operator, because with, back in the old days and still today, it was like, when you take a picture on motion picture film, how do you get it inside the computer? It's like for the computer graphics guys to work on it. You know, now we do it all digitally, so it comes out in a digital format. It's no problem. But in the days when 35 millimeter was the de facto standard for getting an image onto, you know, motion picture film, uh, you had to figure out a way to get it into the computer. So that's what uh, digital scanning and digital cameras are all about. And when I worked at Boss Film, we literally built ours from scratch. We used a medical scanning camera hooked up to pieces of an optical printer with all kinds of different movements like VistaVision, 35 millimeter, and all this kind of stuff. And it was, uh, I actually have a really cool picture, I'll have to post it online someday, of this enormous Rube Goldberg device that we had to build from scratch in order to get film into the camera. So that's what that's all about. Um, now I think they're just called scanner operators or whatever, but because you can buy those things off the shelf now, there's companies that make them. But back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, if you wanted to do digital work, you had to come up with a way of doing that, of getting the film into uh, the computer. And that meant having an in-house electronics and mechanical engineering departments to build those things from the ground up. So there you go. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a very good answer. So we're going to wrap up the, the interview part um, with just a, a couple more questions. So beyond the, the Roger Ebert film, uh, what are you currently working on? Since I know pretty much you can answer that by saying Disney, but uh, anything you can, you can uh, titulate our senses with? No, that's pretty much it, Disney. I'm trying to think of what else beyond that. As you know, all most voiceover work, or we always work so far in advance that uh, all the production companies ask us not to, uh, you know, really discuss things. Um, I've got some really good stuff going on with Disney that's going to premiere this summer. Uh, I'm working with a great uh, crew, or cast rather, including Dee Bradley Baker, who you probably know from The Clone Wars. He and I are in a new series together. And, and um, old noise you can possibly think of from most animal shows. 
<laughs> he can do anything. D can do anything. He's amazing, and he's an you know he's an incredible actor. Uh, you know whether you're giving him animal sounds or whether he's doing you know dialogue for the Clone Warriors or you know it's just he's he's an amazing guy. Um, just recently, I mean, I can talk about what I recently did over the holiday season, the Christmas season. If you're a fan of Raising Hope, I did the Christmas episode, which was a spoof of How the Grinch Stole Christmas. So I narrated it in the vein of Boris Karloff, and they used a lot of the imagery from the Grinch cartoon and made it into live action. It was it was a lot of fun to do. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Yeah, I've got some of the things I just, you know, just can't talk about them. I know it's terrible. I, I feel so I feel so bad whenever I have to say that. It's always I wish, you know, could talk about stuff that's going on right now at this very moment, but there's very little of it that I'm doing that uh is actually you know, it's not like doing working on a live action TV show where you film it and a couple weeks later it's on the air or something, you know. I do have, let's see. There's a new television series out called Kirsty with uh Kirsty Alley and Michael Richards, Rhea Perlman, uh, it's over on TV land. And uh, I did the, I did some voiceover work in the season finale, which is not anywhere near coming out yet. But on the very last episode of the season, I did some very fun stuff on that. And, um, and of course, life itself, when that starts hitting the festival circuit or comes out theatrically, uh, I highly recommend anybody that's into film uh, that they go see that. It's just a, it's a wonderful wonderful motion picture excellent well thank you very much for being on um i'm well, gonna now did, uh, stephanie did you get to ask all your questions because jeremiah said specifically you were bre being uh, being brought on so you could ask the questions you wanted to ask so did you get to ask everything you wanted he, i i think so he did not tell me that i was going to be asking questions uh, oh okay <laughs> i i i i got tired I, I i must have forgotten <laughs> Gotten. Okay. So I've been sitting here trying to think of questions that would be good to ask, but no, that's fine. He goes to conventions. There's no bad questions. I'm, no, I'm that's quite, fine. I'm quite sure yeah. you've been asked some rather strange questions from yeah, lots but, of people. But Jeremiah should know better. <laughs> he should know better. But I, I don't tend to do <laughs> random questions. I always, whenever I interview people, I always have my list, and then I'll go off from there, but I always have to have a list. All right. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure he didn't swipe all the good questions from you. So no, I didn't even think about asking most of the questions he asked. Okay. I'm used to interviewing professors and researchers. and. Oh, not actors. <laughs> no. She is a PR major, though, so maybe someday. someday. Well, I'll uh, hopefully if I, you know, I'll, I'll have to get a couple of degrees under my belt or something. Then we can talk about something <laughs> instead of just voiceover. Yeah, it's weird. I work in mental health and she works in PR. So we have very different yet similar stories of strange things that happen. Well, well you know, I, I work as a dispatcher. So. Well, you work in mental health, so that explains why you know actors so well. Because we all, <laughs> we're all in need of a little bit of therapy for doing this crazy job. <laughs> If only I could share some of the stories I know. But <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna turn off the recorder now. Well, it's so, been uh, talking to both you guys. Thank you. <laughs>